Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here. I don't think that um, when I was leaving for um, my training at Hopkins about 10 years ago, I could imagine to be here with uh, so many people discussing uh, Louis Dietz syndrome. So it's a, a great honor and a great pleasure. And uh, what I would like to do today is um, take you a little bit through uh, the journey that we made um, in um, the year 2002 and the years that came after that. I'm sorry. And, and tell you a little bit on how we discovered um, the, the disease and um, what our current understanding is of the clinical aspects of the disease. And then afterwards, um, Dr. Dietz will, will tell you a little bit more about the latest uh, research insights that we have on uh, Lewis Dietz syndrome. So when I came um, to, to Hopkins um, in 2002, I was mainly interested in um, aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection. And I don't have to convince you that this is an important health problem. And um, if you look from a very broad perspective, um, aortic aneurysm or dilatation comes in two main flavors. That's the ones that are occur in the chest called thoracic aortic aneurysm, and then the ones that are in the abdomen called abdominal aortic aneurysm. And for the second group, uh, we know that um, risk factors such as hypertension, cholesterol, smoking are important, and that there is a little bit of genetics. But then in the thoracic aortic aneurysm group, we know that the genetics play a very important role. And over the last years, we've discovered um, many different types of both syndromic, which means that there is other organ systems involved, and non-syndromic forms of aortic aneurysm. So when I um, came, came to Hopkins, I basically wanted to learn from Dr. Dietz uh, how to um, understand uh, Marfan syndrome, uh, which uh, might be familiar to you. It's a, also an autosomal dominant condition, um, which is caused by a deficiency of an important extracellular matrix protein called fibrillin-1. And it presents symptoms in three major organ systems, which is the skeleton, where you have to think about overgrowth, um, the eye, where there is a dislocated <coughs> lens, and then most importantly, uh, also a dilatation of the aortic root. So um, we, we knew the gene, and uh, we knew also um, a set of clinical criteria to make the diagnosis. And um, through a lot of work um, that uh, was uh, done in, in Hal's lab, um, we started to understand this disease uh, somewhat better. <coughs> and uh, it was discovered in Hal's lab that the fibrillin-1 was not only an important structural molecule, but that it also had a functional role in sequestering an, um, a cytokine called TGF beta. And so in a diseased condition such as Marfan syndrome, you get an overactivation of um, TGF beta, this uh, cytokine. And um, this leads to a cascade of events. Um, so the active TGF beta will bind um, to its receptors, which we'll come back to later, which are at the cell surface. And they um, produce a signal um, that leads to altered uh, gene expression, again influencing um, the extracellular matrix. And uh, through many studies, it was shown that <coughs> many of the characteristics of uh, Marfan syndrome uh, could be uh, <coughs> um, caused by, by a deficiency of this uh, pathway and by overactivation of uh, the TGF beta pathway. So, in 2002, um, I was seeing uh, patients with HAL, and um, HAL had already noticed that there were some patients that <clears throat> didn't really fit within the Marfan uh, spectrum. And, and one of the, of the uh, challenges was, could we find a pattern uh, within uh, these uh, patients? And indeed, uh, we were able to show that in about a dozen patients, uh, there was a recurrent team that we usually did not see in Marfan syndrome, but that we saw in uh, a new syndrome. And I'll, I'll just uh, point you to the main characteristics that were um, um, delineating this new entity, which is the widely spaced eyes, which we call hypertillorism, and the presence of a bifid uvula or a cleft palate, and you basically have to um, consider a bifid uvula as a minimal uh, cleft palate. And then, and I was most striking, um, these patients had um, quite severe um, early onset aortic aneurysms that were not limited to the aortic root as you would see in Marfan syndrome, but uh, occurred throughout um, the arterial tree and also um, were combined with a phenomenon called arterial tortuosity, 
which is a twisting and winding of the arteries. So normally these arteries coming off the aorta should go straight to the brain and you can see that they make full turns. So because we're also geneticists, we wanted to know um, what's the inheritance of this. And uh, we learned this from studying uh, families where <coughs> we saw segregation of um, aortic aneurysms together with uh, the bifid uvulas. And unfortunately, this also um, teaches us that um, this was a, a more severe condition in which aortic dissections occur at uh, smaller diameters than what we usually see in Marfan syndrome. So um, by that time, we identified about <coughs> 10 patients, and they had uh, findings in common with Marfan syndrome, uh, mostly the skeletal, but they also had many unique features that we did not see in Marfan syndrome. I already mentioned the typical ones, in addition to that, we also found craniosynostosis, um, um, a premature uh, closure of the sutures of the skull bones. There is increased incidence of club feet. They have neck instability. And um, there's other um, um, cardiovascular congenital anomalies and also skin findings, such as easy bruising. I'll come back to that in detail. So in 2004, um, I think Hal kind of challenged me and said, <laughs> tried to find um, the, the, the gene uh, causing this condition. And I'll tell you what he said. He said, um, if you can find the cause of this gene, I'll retire. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> we did find the genes, but fortunately he did not retire. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll briefly explain you how we came up with the genes. Um, it was kind of reverse of what we usually do. We were reading in the literature that um, mice that were lacking um, the TGA beta receptor 2 had features that were very reminiscent of what we're seeing in the patients. They had um, aortic um, abnormalities, they had cleft palate, and they also had skull bones that <coughs> were abnormal, all features that we had seen in the, in the Louis Tietz syndrome. So then we started sequencing um, this gene, and here is the receptor again that I showed you earlier. Um, and it has three parts to it, an extracellular part, the yellow one, where the TGA beta binds. Then the, the blue one, that's the transmembrane part sitting in the cell membrane. And then most importantly, uh, the intracellular domain, which is in red, uh, which uh, is responsible for transmitting the signal to the, to the cell. And in red, um, you can see the mutations that we found in um, the first six patients. And then uh, soon after that, our attention also turned to the binding component um, of uh, receptor 2 being receptor 1, and we found uh, additional four mutations. So uh, since then, we've discovered many other um, mutations, and um, it also <coughs> Um, put um, this uh, new condition in, in a pathway um, that I've shown you earlier uh, where a deficiency of uh, the receptors um, led to a similar um, phenotype as in, as in Marfan syndrome. So uh, we published the findings in 2005 and 2006, and um, I think there was three main uh, lessons that we could um, derive at that time. Uh, first of all, we've shown it's an autosomal dominant condition, so we can segregate in families with a recurrence risk of 50%. That's about one-third of uh, the patients. But then about two-thirds of the patients, the mutation is called de novo, means that neither of the parents is affected and that uh, the mutation occurred for the first time in the family. We found mutations in the TGI beta receptor 2 gene in about two-thirds to three-quarters of the patients, and about one-third was TGI beta receptor 1. And occasionally, we saw patients that did not have uh, mutations in um, either receptor 1 or receptor 2, uh, pointing at the fact that maybe other genes were important. And I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. And um, somewhat disappointing, but that's something that we've seen in, in other conditions, is that it, it's very hard um, to predict uh, the clinical outcome uh, from the mutation. There is some hints, uh, but it's really difficult to use that in an individual patient. Then, um, in, the, in the beginning, we also um, described um, two types of um, LDS, um, the type 1, which had the more pronounced craniofacial features, whereas the type 2 had uh, mild or no uh, craniofacial features and showed some more overlap with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, another connective tissue disease that's characterized by skin findings, joint hypermobility, and, and hollow organ ruptures. Uh, we now consider this may be a little bit artificial and uh, would say that um, the LDS is, is a spectrum or a continuum uh, where you can find um, 
overlap uh, between uh, the different types that we initially described. And then uh, most importantly, I think, is the clinical lessons that we learned from studying LDS is that <clears throat> This disease has a different natural history and management strategy than, than Marfan syndrome. And the fact that we observed that dissections occurred at smaller diameters and at younger ages than in Marfan syndrome, so we have to think earlier about surgery and be more aggressive about it. And also, uh, we learned that the disease is not limited to um, the aortic root, as it is usually in Marfan syndrome, but it's more widespread and that we need to do more complete imaging of the um, arterial tree uh, from head to pelvis. So um, the rest of my talk, I, I would like to expand a little bit on uh, what the clinical features are of the disease, um, what our current uh, management strategies are, and then in the end I'll uh, show you how uh, two new genes have been added to the list of um, genes that are causing um, Lewis Dietz syndrome. So. Um, by, by seeing uh, more patients, um, we've confirmed that um, the hypertelorism is um, present in the, in the majority of the patients, although not always. Um, the presence of the cleft palate and the bifid uvula is, is very common, and um, the uvula abnormalities come in, in different flavors, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, we observed that craniosynostosis was probably a little bit less frequent than we initially uh, reported. We confirmed the presence of um, eye-finding strabismus, in which, <coughs> uh, and also the presence of uh, a rather bluish sclera, which is a phenomenon that's caused by the fact that the sclera are thinner and that you're looking at, at the veins at the back of the eye. So uh, what did we uh, see very often? Uh, the thin skin, which um, is represented by the vi easy visibility of the blue uh, vein at uh, the nasal bridge. You can also see the blue sclera. Uh, some eye findings that are related to the eye muscles um, causing uh, exotropia. And then uh, different flavors of uh, bifid uvulas. It can be completely uh, separated and, and having two uvulas. Others are more uh, subtle with uh, a broad uvula and a small raffae uh, in the middle. So when, when I um, um, teach uh, other physicians about um, Lewis Dietz syndrome. I tell them to look very carefully at the face. It can help you a lot. But I also ask them to look very carefully <laughs> to, the, to the uvula because there they can find <laughs> other clues. Joint laxity, but also uh, joint contractures. On average, um, um, the uh, Lewis Dietz syndrome patients um, are not um, as tall as the Marfan patients. And also, if you do um, the measurements, uh, they are more uh, proportionate with regards to arm spans and upper to lower segment ratios. Um, in the hands, um, you can see the long fingers uh, with um, deviations of the fingers uh, caused by contractures, but also remarkable uh, joint hyperlaxity. About one third of the patients has um, club feet and also uh, a, a forefoot virus, which is a, an inward rotation of, of the forefoot, going along with um, flat feet in um, a large majority of the patients. Something that we had um, seen um, initially, but has turned out to be more important uh, than we initially anticipated, is the um, cervical spine abnormalities. Um, it can occur at uh, all ages or be detected at all ages. In some patients, it will need um, surgical stabilization, and it might be complicated by the fact that there is also uh, a decrease in uh, bone quality. Um, and um, so uh, we've added to the guidelines that um, an initial uh, evaluation of a Lewis Dietz patient should include a flexion extension, neck film, x-ray, to look for these abnormalities, which is extremely important um, if you need uh, future surgery that the surgeons know that they cannot hyperextend uh, the neck. With regards to the skin findings, these seem to be very common. Um, they show uh, overlap with um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so you can observe a thin or translucent skin. It has a smooth, velvety aspect to it. Very often, the patients mention uh, easy bruising and the occurrence of uh, dystrophic scars. Um, hernia, both uh, inguinal, umbilical, are, are very common. And as in other connective tissue diseases, we also observe um, that um, dural ectasia is quite common. Uh, this um, widening of the dura um, does not usually cause um, clinical symptoms, uh, but it can be detected occasionally on um, CT scans or MRIs of, of the lower back. 
Then um, other recurrent uh, findings, um, <coughs> including the dental problems, um, higher incidence of um, headaches, and then two uh, important issues um, being the allergic disease that can present itself as seasonal allergies, asthma, sinusitis, or eczema. And then uh, also quite a lot of patients present with gastrointestinal problems with food allergies, eosinophilic esophagitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. I, I will not go into detail. I, there is uh, workshops on this um, this afternoon, and there's other people that know much more about this than I do. So, um, so with regards to the cardiovascular system, um, <clears throat> the um, initial observation of um, arterial tortuosity and aortic aneurysms have largely been confirmed. Um, although not all patients do have tremendous arterial tortuosity, if it is present, it's usually present in the vessels that go um, to the head and, and neck, um, so being the carotid, the vertebral, and the um, carotid arteries. <coughs> um, in other patients with more severely, uh, more severe presentations, it can also affect um, the rest of um, the aorta. Um, the Arterial tortuosity in itself um, usually does not cause uh, any problems and is, is, is rather benign, uh, although uh, we have seen some examples of an explained stroke in some rare patients. So uh, again, uh, confirming the need to do um, a, a, a profound diagnostic evaluation that uh, should include a 3D CT scan uh, from head to pelvis at least once um, at the moment of uh, initial diagnosis in every patient and then depending on the results of that in the further follow-up. As already said, the aneurysms um, mainly occur at the aortic root, but um, also the other parts of the aorta are involved in this condition, and um, not only affecting the aorta, but also the side branches coming off of the aorta, and about 30% uh, of the patients have um, aneurysms at uh, other arteries uh, not uh, being the aorta. So um, we also uh, need to follow up uh, on this. Um, as I said, um, I think it's important to do a 3D CT scan or an MRI <coughs> in any patient, and then depending on the initial uh, results uh, to follow up on that um, with an interval that uh, is de determined by the findings of the first um, imaging study. Um, it could be yearly if there is um, aneurysms, could be every two to three years if uh, everything seems quiet. And of course, we need a yearly echocardiographs to follow up um, the root and the ascending aorta. So um, about the management, um, Dr. Dietz will show um, some uh, very nice data that we obtained now in, in, the, in the mice. Um, uh, we believe that uh, losartan um, is beneficial to the patients uh, with uh, Lewis Dietz syndrome. Um, it can be used either alone or in combination with the beta blockers. <coughs> And um, importantly, it's also to um, add in um, exercise restrictions to avoid um, competitive sports and um, isometric exercise. With regards to uh, the management, um, we've um, delineated some um, surgical um, guidelines. Um, nothing is written in stone, but um, I think uh, we can confirm that uh, dissections occur at smaller diameters so that uh, earlier surgery intervention than in Marfan syndrome uh, is indicated. So for um, very um, severely affected um, children, um, also somewhat there's a relationship with the uh, amount of craniofacial features, we recommend to do um, surgery if the analyst reaches about uh, two centimeters. In uh, other patients that have um, less severe um, presentations in, in childhood <coughs> or in which um, a pregnancy is anticipated, the root could be replaced when it reaches a diameter of uh, four centimeters. And then in other families where there is a milder presentation, um, depending on the family history, um, one could wait until 4.5 centimeters. For the surgical management of um, other aneurysms, it's very dependent on the site and the nature um, of, the, um, of the lesion. And um, also in general here, we will use a more aggressive approach than in other diseases and uh, both uh, surgical and uh, non-surgical um, endovascular uh, treatment strategies can be um, considered. 
one of the good things I think uh, we learned over the last um, five or six years is that um, the outcome of the surgery has been excellent. So if we can detect um, the aneurysms in a timely fashion and do surgery in an elective way, uh, the outcome of the patients um, is, is um, excellent. And that should give us uh, hope that um, um, if we can make a timely diagnosis that uh, there is also excellent uh, treatment options. Um, I want to spend uh, a little bit of time on, on some controversy that's going on in, 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 the, in the field of, of aortic aneurysm. Um, people have described uh, mutations in the same genes, uh, TGI beta receptor 1 and 2, also in patients of what they call Marfan syndrome or in patients that they describe as um, familial thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissections, which is a condition in which there is no other um, systemic findings, only the aneurysm and the dissections. We've looked into that uh, from a genetic perspective, and what we can tell is that um, we've seen the exact same mutations uh, causing uh, Lewis Dietz syndrome for any of the mutations that has been reported in association with Marfan syndrome or familial thoracic aortic aneurysm. So this does not exclude that there is some uh, variability um, in the disease, uh, but it also um, indicates that we cannot rely on the mutation uh, to predict what's going to be the outcome. And also we've seen um, um, patients, uh, parents that presented uh, with milder uh, phenotypes, which <clears throat> at first glance maybe could be classified as familial thoracic aortic aneurysms, but then uh, they went on to have children that had uh, classic features of um, Lewis Dietz syndrome. So what I think is going on is that um, there is some selection bias um, that um, from a pediatric perspective, um, you see more um, isolated probands with more uh, systemic craniofacial findings that have more severe cardiovascular outcomes. And then there is other um, familial cases uh, with uh, less systemic uh, features that fit uh, more into the FDA spectrum, and that's probably um, determined by, by genetic modifiers. And I think there is still a lot of work to do uh, to exactly find out uh, what's causing this uh, variability. Um, last year, uh, a group from um, Rotterdam, uh, Erasmus University, uh, reported another um, cause for um, aortic aneurysm, and uh, they described an association between um, the aneurysm and the onset, the early onset of um, osteoarthritis. Um, if you look at the description that they give in this uh, paper, uh, you can see that there is a, uh, an important overlap with Lewis D syndrome. So the patients also present with um, hypertelorism, so the widely spaced eyes, uh, the bifid uvula, and skin findings, including uh, thin skin and uh, also um, easy bruising, uh, abnormal scarring. They describe um, in their um, paper an uh, association <coughs> with osteoarthritis, uh, that's uh, mostly affecting uh, the knees and also um, the spine. Interestingly, um, they also found that um, there is an association with increased TGI beta signaling. So similar to what we saw in Marfan syndrome and Lewis Dietz syndrome, um, when you have a deficiency of uh, this protein, uh, SMAT3, you see an overall um, hyperactivation of the TGI beta signaling pathway. Uh, we've also identified uh, several uh, mutations in, in this gene, and um, we've shown that not all the patients did have this um, early onset uh, osteoarthritis. So again, confirming that there is a variability and uh, overlap uh, with uh, Lewis Dietz syndrome. So when you uh, compare the two uh, phenotypes, I would say that <coughs> the symmetry mild, might represent somewhat milder end of the spectrum. Although I've also seen families with early onset <coughs> dissection at young age, so again, a wide variability. Um, about 50% of the initial patients were um, reported to have this knee lesion called osteochondritis dissecans, and about 90% had uh, interverbal uh, disc degeneration. However, this might also be somewhat a selection bias, and specifically looking for patients that had these osteoarthritis uh, phenomenas and in association with uh, aortic aneurysmal disease. So um, here are some images uh, from the um, follow-up paper um, describing very similar findings to LDS, aneurysms, um, also um, tortuosity um, of the veins, and also aneurysms at uh, side branches uh, of the uh, aorta, so very similar to what is seen in LDS. 
Again, uh, the uh, skeletal findings with um, intervertebral disc degeneration and <coughs> I'm sorry, um, uh, knee problems. So here are some uh, faces, all the red ones belonging to one uh, big uh, Dutch uh, family. Uh, some of them have um, LDS-like features with hypertelorism, others uh, uh, don't. So this adds in another um, key player on the uh, um, overview of the pathway. So um, mutations in this uh, SMAT3 uh, protein um, are uh, very related to what we've described in uh, LDS and, and Marfan syndrome. And then finally, I would like to share some uh, new results. Um, <coughs> I, um, I also have a, a, an aneurysm clinic in the, in the Netherlands where I go once a month. And in that clinic, we observed uh, this patient that had experienced a thoracic aortic dissection at age uh, 42. He did have some Marfan features, which uh, included a tall stature, high arched palate, uh, long fingers, and a small chin but also some Louis Dietz-like features uh, with hypertelorism, club feet, and uh, camptodactyly, so contractures of the toes. And he also had uh, mild uh, learning problems. And so uh, we looked at all the known genes, and it turned out that we didn't find any genetic um, error in any of these genes. And because uh, he had uh, mild uh, learning problems, uh, we decided to apply another uh, genetic uh, technique, which is called a microarray. And what a microarray does, it looks in the chromosomes for small uh, deletions, so pieces of chromosomes that are missing. And we found uh, a deletion in this uh, patient on the long arm of uh, chromosome 1, which was not present in any of his other uh, family members. We then looked into databases and found <coughs> similar patients. Um, it was uh, this boy, which was followed in Sweden. And uh, we also asked to do an um, echo on him, and it turned out that he also had an um, aortic root dilatation. And then what you can do is you can look at the genes that are present um, in, the, in the deletion and see if you can find a strong candidate that would explain um, what we found in the patient. And it will not surprise you that we immediately picked uh, this one uh, being uh, TJ beta 2 which is the ligand that binds to the receptors. So. Uh, what we did is uh, we sequenced uh, another 100 patients that were negative for any of the known genes and were able uh, to find uh, six additional uh, mutations um, um, affecting uh, the function of the, of the TJ beta 2. So this is the latency associated peptide which uh, binds to uh, TJ beta 2 and is important for the interaction with the matrix. And then here is the active uh, cytokine uh, itself. And uh, all these mutations were also shown to lead to a loss of uh, function. <coughs> so here is the families. As you can see, some of them are isolated cases that occurred um, de novo. And in other families, um, the uh, mutation uh, tracked uh, with uh, the presence of um, aortic dissections and, and aneurysms. So here are some images of some of the other patients, again showing hypertelorism, um, the small chin, the flat feet, somewhat Marfan with uh, hands, um, pectus deformities, um, all very similar to what we've seen in um, LDS. So if you put uh, the four conditions uh, next to each other, you can see that there is an important overlap in the clinical features um, of um, these different um, uh, genes. Um, the one important difference with uh, Marfan syndrome is that uh, we didn't see any eye problems uh, in the form of uh, ectopia lentis. Um, but for all the other findings, we could find significant uh, overlap. So um, <coughs> we also looked at um, the aortas of these patients. And importantly, uh, we, we've seen that um, the um, aortic wall architecture is disturbed in a very similar way as in Marfan syndrome, as in LDS. We also looked at the effect on the TJ beta signaling, and uh, Dr. Dietz will expand on that, and uh, we showed that uh, there is, again, increased uh, signaling uh, going on. So confirming this pattern over and over that if you knock out uh, components uh, of this pathway, um, we've now uh, four different um, conditions in the TJ beta signaling pathway that lead to a loss of function of protein function, but an overall effect uh, of increased TJ beta signaling. 
So I want to end uh, by concluding that uh, over the last uh, five years, six years, we've gained a better knowledge of the clinical phenotypes, that we've expanded uh, the genetic basis with uh, two more genes, and that there is also a promising uh, therapeutic options. And I would like to thank um, all the oh, <laughs> um, uh, patients and their families. Uh, I would like to thank the Louis Tietz Syndrome Foundation, and I would like to especially thank Hal for uh, being such a great mentor. Thank you.